So let's get started. So when we talk about sound and vibration, we want to start this whole presentation by really laying down some ground facts. These are the facts that we can understand and accept as common knowledge through our understanding of science and what's accepted by the mainstream. This is accepted by the mainstream. So the universal facts, what are they? We are vibratory and energy beings. Okay, quantum physics, that's the rule 101 right there. Quantum physics proves that on the subatomic level, we're all vibration. And now you go and talk to any Tom, Dick, and Harry, and you tell them that on the subatomic level, we're vibrating. Most people, if they have any grasp of scientific knowledge, would probably agree with you. And my wife and I do sound healings all the time. And we talk to people, and I almost always start by saying, well, we're all vibratory beings on a subatomic level. We're vibrating. And even when we don't have people that have ever been a part of this before, everybody agrees they can understand that because it's pretty much commonly accepted now. Our brains produce electricity. So in our brains, there is a form of acid that gets produced. This acid creates an electrical current, fires up the synapses in our brain, goes down our spinal, down our brain stem, down our nervous system, down the spinal column, it creates an electrical current. So we now know, we can prove, and we can measure that our brains produce a form of electricity. Vibration and frequency is measured in hertz. So this is important to know how we actually measure vibration and frequency. 97% <clears throat> of our DNA is junk, unused DNA, so they say. But really, we know that there is no junk DNA, and actually, maybe, that 97% of our DNA is actually dormant DNA that can be activated. So they say that exists. They say, oh, look, this, look at the DNA strands that we have here, but 97% of it isn't working. So therefore, it's junk DNA. We don't need it. No, we don't have DNA within our cells that is 97% not usable and never be used just because it's there. We have it there because it's there for a different reason. And we'll get into that a little later and talk about how our DNA is actually synchronized harmonically and through music intervals. So what I believe through our junk DNA is that we have multiple strands and some people say 12 strands and through sound and frequency, we can actually activate that. So that's a common knowledge right there. They're not saying mainstream science is not saying that we have um, we have DNA that can be activated. They're just saying it's junk DNA. But what they don't realize is they've given us now a clue to the fact that there is multiple DNA strands. And now that kind of proves a lot of things that we've talked about in the esoteric community about 12 strand DNA activation. And the universe is singing. So towards the end of the presentation, we're going to show you exactly how the universe is singing. Humans have lived on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years, more than widely accepted. So a lot of this is based on our true world history, the ancient origins of humanity. And our, my past presentation talks about that entirely, but we're going to touch on it today and just pick up on the key parts of that, really to just bring it home to how that is important. And humans have lived on the world for hundreds of thousands of years, and we've noticed that there's been a frequency fluctuation that has dictated the experiences that we've had on this planet. So that's a very key point. Why sound? I love this quote. This quote kind of sums up everything about why I'm even doing this presentation in the first place. The forms of snowflakes and the faces of flowers may take on this shape because they're responding to some sound in nature. Likewise, it is possible that crystals, plants, and human beings may be in some way music that has taken on visible form. So what it's saying here is that we know snowflakes, we know flowers like the sunflower are all taking on these beautiful geometrical shapes. And we can now prove that they're actually reflections of the frequency of the seed, of the plant, frequency around it. But why would that not be the same thing for everything else if all those things are actually taking on a manifestation from frequency and geometry of that frequency? Maybe crystals, which I definitely believe are, plants and human beings, as well as us, in some way are music that take on a uh, visible form. Well, if the universe is one verse, one musical song, and we come from the universe, it only makes sense that we're a reflection of that sound. Okay, so some of what we're gonna talk today, <laughs> What you will learn, what I really want you to get out of this is an understanding that consciousness, spirituality, extraterrestrials, and more can all be explained scientifically through quantum physics. I would say everything, really. And also, religion and science are now merging. We've lived in a world where religion and science have been two separate entities for quite some time. But now, due to quantum physics, we're actually merging the two disciplines. 
Eastern and Western philosophy and medication are needed to work together to cure all illness. How does this have to do with medication? Well, quantum physics allows us to tap in on the quantum level and the vibratory level of what is happening within the body. If we were to put money and research into quantum physics, we could figure out how to cure all illnesses, which is part of the reason why it's still a theory and it's not funded so much. But what we really need to do is we need to marry the two. East and West need to come together because there's a place for medication when your leg is chopped off and there's a place for cancer when you don't need to have chemotherapy and you can actually have quantum technology that has actually worked and I've seen multiple videos from different people that actually can cure cancer. So also the human brain and plant medicine, we're gonna, I want you to get an understanding of how the human brain works and how that connects to DMT and then even plant medicines such as ayahuasca, iboga, mushrooms. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about sacred geometry and then go into sulfagial frequencies and the history of the sulfagial tones. So we're gonna jump uh, from we're going to cover quite a lot today. There's going to be a lot of information. I'm also going to show you quite a few videos. So we're going to jump from um, certain topics to other topics, and some of them are going to funnel into each other perfectly. But we're also going to show you some mini documentaries also on this three, uh, 432 hertz frequency and the sulfagial frequency. So we may be going on for a little over two hours, maybe up to three hours. Okay. So quantum and physics and metaphysics connection. For quite some time, I've been feeling that – Metaphysics and quantum physics were one and the same. Quantum physics, metaphysics. So I've come to this realization that metaphysics and quantum physics are one and the same. They're the exact same thing. Quantum physics explains things on the scientific level with the terms, the terminology that we've given things such as black holes, um, the void in space, and different terms of what we can understand on the quantum level and the subatomic level. And metaphysics is the same thing to me. What I've been saying for quite some time, not to my friends, is that metaphysics to me is metaphorical quantum physics. Where in quantum physics, you have these terms that I just stated. In metaphysics, you have terms that are similar to that mean the same thing, but it's metaphor to mean the exact same thing. So just knowing that and spending some time and researching that and getting this awareness out, showing the similarities, I feel can bring a lot of people that can accept quantum physics into the understanding of metaphysics. So both of these disciplines are based on the principles of vibration and frequency. We know that. Meditation and metaphysical practices are designed to increase your vibration. So in, met in metaphysics and spiritual awareness, meditation, whether you're meditating or doing yoga or um, getting Reiki healing done or get some type of en other energy work or even having some good food that is really higher vibratory organic food, what is happening is you're ingesting or you're meditating and raising your vibratory frequency. And even the term raising is kind of um, misleading because we don't really know if you're raising it as in zero to 100, but something is happening to your frequency, allowing your frequency to become more harmonic. Now in quantum physics, we're talking about frequency as well. So we're now noticing that it's the exact same thing. These Eastern faiths of um, like Hinduism, for example, and Buddhism are actually talking about the same concepts that we're only now rediscovering. Those that have obtained enlightenment have in essence raised their vibratory frequency, which is measured in hertz. So whether you call it enlightenment or you have your own awakening experience, or if you're on a psychedelic plant medicine even, and you have an awakening experience, something is happening to your vibratory frequency. Everything that you um, do and ingest uh, affects your vibratory frequency. Whether it's coffee, that's even affecting your vibratory frequency. We exist, especially in the Western world, in a pool of frequency and vibration. Right now, the amount of frequencies that are around me, going through me, are countless. I probably won't be able to count them because they're just happening all the time, always. And those frequencies, not only of what is just a swimming pool of frequencies around me, but the frequencies of all the items that I own and my own vibratory being and my own organs, my chakra points, the tuning fork next to me, the bowl, everything has its own vibratory frequency. And what's happening, is that frequency is actually affecting mine. So I am an accumulation of multiple frequencies averaged. What exactly is quantum physics? So for you who don't know, here's a little explanation of quantum physics. Quantum mechanics, which is basically the mechanics of everything on the quantum level, how everything works on the quantum level, is also known as quantum theory. It's a fundamental branch of physics that deals with attempting to define and understand the subatomic world, the subatomic world. So what is a subatomic world? We have the atom and we have everything below it, what the atom's made out of, the electrons, protons, photons. 
um, the nucleus. Um, then even below that, the frequencies. So quantum physics is attempting to quantify what is happening on the subatomic world, uh, world. Whereas Newtonian physics, which is classical physics, which is what they teach you in science class in high school, just a basic level up, is dealing with everything on the physical world, atom and above. So Newtonian physics is dealing with everything that is solid matter that is perceptible to the familiar human experience. Whereas quantum physics is dealing with everything that makes up that physical experience that we don't even know exists. What is metaphysics? The metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things, including abstract concepts such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time and vibration, and space. And now it's basically synonymous with esoteric wisdom. I would say that everything that we present on Portal to Ascension and all the things I spoke about earlier really goes in the field of metaphysics. So it's dealing with all these abstract cosmic universal ideas. While I was doing this presentation, it's just over a year ago I created this presentation, I was, I was thinking and contemplating for quite some time about the different terms in quantum physics and the different terms in metaphysics and seeing which ones are the same. And I came up with this graph that I created here that kind of shows you um, the similarities. So in quantum physics, for example, you have singularity. So what is a singularity? The singularity is the single point within the void, the black hole. People like Nassim Haramein say that everything is made out of black holes on a subatomic level, that on the subatomic level, you will find the black hole. Therefore, all things are made out of many black holes and the black holes are spewing out energy and matter that kind of present the physical reality. So even further than that, what we've proven with quantum physics, what they say within quantum physics is that the void inside the black hole, like the center of our galaxy, for example, has this super massive black hole, but the void inside of it is the singularity. And there's 12 points of singularity within one black hole. So that's another concept that they've come up with. But what do we have in metaphysics? Singularity within the void is oneness. So it's the same exact thing, where in metaphysics we realize the oneness with it all, but in quantum physics it's the singularity, it's finding the void and being within the one. And then we have another term, quantum field. In metaphysics we have consciousness. And then in quantum physics again, electromagnetic field. And in metaphysics we have the aura. And we'll talk about those two on the next, um, next slide. Then quantum physics, wave. Metaphysics, vibration. Frequency, vibration again. Quantum physics, dimension, metaphysics, we also use the word dimension at times, but realm is really used within the metaphysical community. So it's the same thing. It's just another realm of existence, another dimension of existence. And then we have energy, energy, and then paradox, which is my favorite thing, my favorite word, and I say it all the time because I notice it everywhere, is the same thing in quantum physics and metaphysics. We have the paradox. Uh, it is and it isn't. Everything is infinite, but it's also finite. We exist, but do we exist? All of these are paradoxes that seem to not be able to coexist. And quantum physics is the epitome of a paradox because quantum physics and Newtonian physics don't go hand in hand. They, can, they technically cannot coexist. So therefore, quantum physics is paradoxical in nature because everything we're understanding from quantum physics should not be how it really is and isn't the way we've defined reality ever since Newtonian, Newton. Newton. So here we go again with the aura and the electromagnetic field. So this is kind of like just a visual representation of what I was talking about. And this kind of, this shows you the similarities in it. So here we go on the left-hand side, we have the aura. And this aura is the hu human aura based on our own vibratory frequency, based on things that we eat, our own belief systems, um, the amount of love we have for ourselves, the alignment of our chakras, um, the frequencies of our organs, all these different elements contribute to a vibratory frequency that creates an electromagnetic field around our body that we call the aura. Earth also has an aura. The earth, everything in the heavens and the universe and the multiverse has a vibratory frequency because it's all made out of subatomic particles. So everything that has a vibratory frequency can actually manifest or will manifest an aura, an electromagnetic field. The frequency of the earth is a Schumann resonance and the Schumann resonance generates its own electromagnetic field, though its own aura. And you can see here in the lower part of 
of here, the electromagnetic field of the earth, which is the aura of the earth, which protects us from the sun's harmful radiation and waves. So it's the same exact thing. Quantum physics and metaphysics are the same exact thing. Physics and spirituality. Like I said earlier, science and religion are separate and they're at odds with each other. And they've been like that for a long, long time. And we said that sciences in today's world are based on Newtonian physics. So they just don't see how quantum physics can really represent reality because Newtonian physics is represents everything that we can see, feel, and touch. So what does this mean? If we know that this is a solid desk right here, there's a solid desk in front of me, there's a webcam looking at me, there's people on the other side of this um, viewing this webinar, but we can now prove that on the quantum level, all of that is just frequency and energy that doesn't exist as physical matter at all. That physical matter should not exist. Everything that we've been teaching ourselves in linear science, we have now realized completely should be thrown out of the window because what makes up linear sciences is something that's nonlinear. Quantum physics is a nonlinear science that is the building blocks for all things linear. It doesn't make sense. So they don't go hand in hand. So this is where in lies the illusion. To me, that means that this reality isn't really what we perceive it to be at all. And we cannot prove that it's not what we perceive it to be. The only thing that exists are frequencies and our perception, the way we perceive the frequencies is the dream or a very advanced virtual reality program. So not to say like virtual reality is in computer, Android, synthetic kind of mentality, but an organic conscious advanced virtual reality that if everything is frequency, vibration and frequency at different levels, then all it is is a bunch of ones and zeros, for lack of a better term, or a bunch of computer programs in different areas that are very intricately created to give us this virtual reality experience of the reality and Earth and the universe. And most, a lot of you probably heard about the holographic universe theory, and it seems like from what we're understanding now through quantum physics is that there may be some truth to that. So illusion, you say, yes. Well, the very act of watching, the observer affects the observed reality. So we're going to get into um, this experiment here where that kind of shows you that this may be an illusion and that our intention and the way we observe things actually affect them. That not just from us actually touching it, but just observe it, observation and intention itself affects the outcome of certain, um, certain situations. So researchers at the Wiseman Institute of Science, they've conducted an experiment demonstrating how a beam of electrons is affected by the act of being observed. The experiment revealed that the greater the amount of watching, the greater the observer's influence of what actually takes place. So a position of a particle of the quantum state cannot be determined unless a measurement of its position is made. So unless a me measurement of the position is made, meaning unless you look at the beam of light doing what it's doing, you will not be able to determine where it's going. So you can shoot a beam of light and you know that it's going to hit right there. But if you don't look at it, it may not even hit there at all. In matter, as a matter of fact, we can't even pinpoint where it is in time and space. And they will completely do something that shows us infinite possibilities rather than one. But the second we look at it, the second we look at it, all of a sudden, boom, does exactly what we would expect from it to do based on our own beliefs of how physics works. And here is the double slit experiment that I'm referring to. So the very act of watching the observer affects the observed reality. <clears throat> when we watch this and we send a photon, photons through this first slit right here, when we're watching it, it will just come through as one, continue through and just hit the back on the second, um, the second uh, plank right here. But as soon as we don't watch it, then the light acts simultaneously, simultaneously as a particle and a wave. Whereas before it was acting just as a wave and it was hitting that, but when we don't look at it, it's existing as two different forms, a particle and a wave, a quantum physics and Antonian physics concept, and it splits and goes through the second slit right there and then makes multiple impacts on the, on the back wall right at the end over here. And what it's really doing is when we don't look at it, the light has infinite possibilities of where it can go when we're not observing it as infinite realities that it creates. And then when we look back at it, we see that it's had all this impact and the light has gone everywhere. But when we look at it, it only has one reality. <clears throat> 
So here's a little more about this. And we're going to actually, I'm going to show you a little um, four minute video in just a couple seconds that really explains the double slit experiment. And we'll get into talking about that once that's over. But when the being, when, when being observed, the electrons will bounce up the barrier. So if we look at it, it bounces up. When not observed, the electrons will act as waves and make it through the barrier. When not observed, the electron would exist in two locations simultaneously. So the electron was bilocating, existing in multiple places at the same exact time. Here's a better image of that, the double slit experiment. And this experiment is really groundbreaking in our understanding of reality and who we are and mo multiple realities and parallel realities. And this really led to the concept of that there are multiple parallel realities existing all the time in this now moment. Let's see, here we go. Before the observation, wave. And then at the time of observation, becomes a particle. So the particle representation, when you look at it and you see the particle, that actually shows us and that it actually exists in a particular space and time. It actually exists. So when we look at it, it exists. But when we don't look at it, the wave representation asserts an uncertainty of location until the entity is observed. So this leads me to the concept that um, the saying, if you will, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? As According to this, no, it doesn't. According to quantum physics, if a tree falls in the woods and we're not observing it, it does not make a sound. But Newtonian physics says that it does. Does the world, so this is a question that we need to ask ourselves, really. Does the world we live in really exist when we aren't looking? Or is it just frequency passing us by? I would say that it's both. I would say that the paradox is that the world exists and it doesn't exist. It's just frequency just having all these experience in it. But the frequency has created this reality for us that feels real, know, we know is real, we can explore. It's become a reality to us. So even though we can prove that everything is just frequency and vibration, we can also prove that everything is actually solid and existing right here and now. So there's another paradox that quantum physics brings forth. There's a saying that we are one speck of light experiencing the self infinitely and in multiple forms. When I first got into esoteric wisdom, I went to expos and listened to different speakers. I heard this term quite a few times. And basically the whole premise is that there's just one speck of light and the light is just going fast as anything, just like creating multiple experiences within that range of frequency. There's multiple, multiple experiences. So all we really are is this one frequency vibration that has is experiencing itself infinite ways in all ways possible at every frequency level that it can be and in multiple forms simultaneously. Why is this important? Well, quantum physics is the bridge that is needed now to bring sciences and spiritual traditions in the world to glide together. So it's, it's time now really for us to bring the two modalities together. When we bring quantum physics and spiritual spirituality together, we can not only justify it, rationalize, and come through a logical standpoint to spirituality, which is considered to be blind faith and uh, just believing in something, but we can start understanding that, wow, we can prove that this is real. And once we know this spiritual stuff is real, then we'll spend more time on it, um, spend more money on it, research it, a lot more people will get into it, and then we can truly create the world that I want to live on this planet, which is a world where we exist in harmony and in oneness with everything. And the way for that, the way for us to live in harmony with everything isn't just by hoping people will just take it as a leap of faith that we're all one, but even maybe showing people and appeasing their minds, the linear minds with the science behind how we're all one. And part of this presentation is really to do that. Nassim Haramein is one of the biggest people in my life that really led me to a lot of this awareness because he proved that we're all one through mathematics. He's showing us that the mathematical equations of oneness. So just, this is just the beginning stages right now. Once, we're just doing these presentations, getting this awareness out there. It's just the beginning of the shift. And then ultimately, we're going to live in a world where this is just going to be mainstream common knowledge. That, oh, yeah, quantum physics and spirituality, they're just one and the same. It's also the science where all religion was derived. When I was doing research for on ancient civilizations back in the day, and then also for my last presentation, I came to a realization that all of these ancient stories were talking about frequency, whether it was sound and frequency, or whether they were talking about specific tones 
or even having depictions of wormholes in the scriptures, like the Sumerian scriptures. The serpent in some of the Sumerian scriptures actually represents a wormhole. There's a Sumerian um, tablet. Of, uh, there's a Sumerian tablet in which there's a huge Anunnaki god, and then there's a serpent, and then there is the serpent's mouth is open with a human coming out of the other side with a DNA strand. And what that they say the translation for that is is that is the quantum physics and the science that was used by the Sumerians to manipulate the DNA of the human and then travel through from their planet to our planet using quantum physics technology to come to our planet. And there's a lot of other evidence in other scriptures that we found all over the world that showed that the serpent represents their science, their understanding and wisdom. But what was their science back then? Their science wasn't biology and chemistry like we know it. Their science was quantum physics. They didn't even have to deal with chemicals on the level that we deal with in you know, chemistry, for example. When you deal with um, quantum physics and you deal with everything on the subatomic level for chemistry and for biology, you can fix everything at the root, at the quantum level, before you even need to deal with manipulating uh, chemicals together on this third dimensional reality that we're in, or even um, dealing with biology and trying to repair certain organs in the body through surgery. You wouldn't need any of that. You can go and just shift the frequency of the cell and the cell will just get back into harmonic alignment. The universal language is math. <clears throat> so we all know that this is important because the universal language is mathematics. We know that the universe is made out of equations and science and the way the black holes are formed have this science and this equation to it. The way the galaxy spirals are have the same equations to it. So the universal language is math and the mathematical intervals that we use to describe the universe are the same intervals that we actually use for music. So therefore the universal language is music. The universal language is sound and frequency. And here's an, an equation that I came up with. So the universal language to me is quantum physics because quantum physics is <clears throat> mathematic, the mathematics of sound and vibration. The mathematics of sound and vibration is quantum physics. So the universal language of quantum physics equals the mathematics of the vibration of the universe. And if we, I love throwing in little quotes here and there, especially from people that are credible and accepted by the mainstream, because if that isn't real enough for you, check out what Albert Einstein said. He said, concerning matter, we have all been wrong. What we have called matter is energy, whose vibration has been so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses. There is no matter. Albert Einstein, founder of the theory of relativity, um, discoverer of all these sciences that helped create the atom bomb, helped understand all of this awareness and just like bring brought so much to this human experience for all of us. He, even he is saying that matter doesn't exist from all of his understanding. He knows that there is no matter quantum physics hasn't become what it has become now when Albert Einstein was around, but just from him perceiving things, he was like, wait a second, this just doesn't look right. There is no matter vibration has been lowered down lowered down so that we can perceive it with our senses, eyes, ears, nose, taste. We already know that we only perceive a certain uh, frequency of light, that we can only perceive certain light frequency. That's common knowledge. So why is it that it isn't common knowledge that we can also only hear a certain frequency range and experience a certain frequency range? We know that dogs, the dog whistles, for example, humans can't hear it because it's at a frequency that only the dog ear can perceive. So the same, it's the same exact thing. Every single one of our senses has a range of frequencies that it's able to experience. So if that's the case, doesn't it mean that there are other experiences out there at other frequencies that we now know exist that we probably can't even experience at all? Okay, so that was the quantum physics metaphysics component where we're bridging the gap between two of them. Now we're gonna go into another component of this the brain DMT plant medicines and frequency. So specifically how the physiology of the brain is and how that relates to DMT and plant medicines. So the physiology of the brain, there's a few things that we know about the brain that we only use a limited amount of mental ability. And they say that we only use a certain percentage of our brain, but now that's being redefined as well. People think that we actually do use all of our brain, 
because different areas are for different things. It's not like you only use 2% right here or 10% right there. Your brain is triggering everywhere, left, right, hemisphere, all over the place. But we only use a limited mental capacity. Those areas are only fired up to a limited potential. The frequency of those areas are at a limited range that we're using our brain, but the mental capacity isn't really where it could be at its optimum level. A brain also excretes DMT. And we've now proved that for the first three years of our life, brain, our brain is completely full of DMT. So DMT is known as the spirit molecule. It's natural in all living things. There's only one animal on the planet that doesn't excrete DMT, and that's the snake. The snakes don't even have a pineal gland. They're the only animal on the planet without a pineal gland and don't excrete DMTs. Um, if you're uh, if you were a devout Christian, you might think that because the snake is evil. But if you are a spiritualist, you might think because the snake represents wisdom and enlightenment already. You know, so it's kind of a give and take of what really is the reason for that. So a brain excretes DMT. When you hook up a baby, or when they've hooked up babies to EEG machines and kind of test to see what kind of chemicals are going on in the brain, the whole entire brain, while it's forming for the first three years of your life, has DMT everywhere it's just active all the time dmt creates increased visuals and also uh, journey-like experiences just if you took mushrooms or if you took ayahuasca or if you took um, um ecstasy all of those kind of acid all of those kind of experiences are the same experiences that you get from excretion of dmt in your brain so basically we we know that a child's brain is completely full of the same exact chemical that we get when we do all these psychedelic journeys, which is why babies are technically tripping all the time. Their brains get formed in DMT. The other times DMT is released naturally in your brain, we release a bit of it when we sleep that helps us with our visuals. And then when we die, when you die, all of a sudden your brain just excretes DMT in your entire brain. Your brain gets filled with DMT. And what's happening is that the transition from this world into the next world is the exact same thing as a psychedelic um, drug experience that you you ingest that's why they say like when you take mushrooms or ayahuasca it's like being reborn and depending on where you are energetically karmically um or if you feel negative or whatever you're harboring will be your experience so a lot of people get that rebirth feeling some people go through a death-like experience and some people go through a death-like experience that becomes a rebirth experience and that's the same thing that's happening, happening naturally. So we're actually inducing near-death experiences without dying or killing ourselves on any level with these psychedelic plants that are allowing us to have a glimpse into the other world and bring back an awareness into this world so that we can utilize it for here and now. So signs of increased DMT levels, dilated pupils, extreme joy, increased dopamine levels, bliss, cosmic understanding, higher perspective, psychedelic visuals, sacred geometry, symbolism, usage of dormant parts of the brain, and telepathy. So I actually just watched a documentary just a few days ago now on ayahuasca, and the ayahuasca, the key psychedelic within that is DMT. And this guy was all scientific uh, about it. He went down to Peru, hooked himself up to an EEG machine, took this uh, ayahuasca, and then mapped his entire brain. And the next day after he was done, he was just looking at it. And what he saw was that all these dormant areas of the brain were actually being activated at its full potential. And he was getting these visuals of sacred geometry and, um, and a higher perspective, a higher understanding of his place in the universe. Uh, that documentary also showed that parts of the brain that's actually affected, parts of the brain that's actually affected by a DMT uh, release are parts of your brain that are utilized to store early memories in life. So early memories that are specifically trauma related or very significant. So if you have a trauma related experience when you're six to seven years old and it stays with you for your whole life, that part of your brain is getting stimulated. If you have a great experience where you just like loved your family and you remember when you're four years old, um, that will also come in there. So what the DMT does is it actually brings up all the things from the surface in that area where you feel joyous about all the times that you had that were great. And then it brings up all the things that you're traumatized for. It re looks at it. It looks at everything from a logical perspective and it basically says, well, okay, why was I traumatized for this experience? Oh, this is, I'll, I don't like dogs, for example, because one dog barked at me when I was three years old. And ever since then I've hated all dogs. So what will happen is 
over years and years of you hating old dogs because of that, you create more neural networks enforcing the habit, more neural networks enforcing the habit. Now you're a 40 year old person completely freaked out about dogs and it's only because you've enforced that habit over and over again. We, what he proved through hooking himself to EEG machines, those neural networks that are create those habits get rewired and re-networked in order to give you a better perspective and look at things logically so you don't you release trauma. So how is that connected to frequency? So what's happening is the frequency of your brain is actually fluctuating and changing when the DMT gets released, allowing you to tap into higher levels of understanding of yourself and your place in the universe. That that allows you to release and purge and come out much more empowered. And here's a, a little graph of the chakra system just to kind of show you the areas of the areas that DMT is actually released. And if you look here at the top, we have the pineal gland and your pituitary gland, also known as the third eye and the crown chakra. And the DMT, on the next slide, I'll show you exactly the pineal gland. The DMT is released in this area. And what happens when that, that occurs? So let's look at the sixth and the seventh chakra. When DMT is released, the capacity to visualize, understanding concepts, and execution of ideas in a practical way. And then also the seventh chakra, which is a crown chakra, integration of total perspective with life and spiritual aspects. So the third eye is really about like inner knowing and inner understanding of your, yourself and who you are in the grand scheme of the cosmos. And then the the crown chakra is your connection to the divine, like above the universe, the cosmos. All psychedelic drugs, including, including um, induced DMT excretion on some level that is stored in pineal maturity gland that I just showed you. And examples of psychedelics here, if you guys are interested, are mushrooms, peyote, San Pedro, ayahuasca, acid, and MDMA. And this is important to know because this day and age, what is actually occurring and actually occurred last year is a complete release of the disclosure of the understanding of what plant medicines can actually do to your being and your brain. Just a few months ago, might have even been like a few weeks ago, just, but just recently, there was a study released with mushrooms where they showed someone's brain after one experience of mushrooms and they showed someone's brain after three years of experience with therapy. And then the neural networks in the brains were very, very similar. And the brains before that, before the therapy and before the mushrooms were very similar. And it showed to them that mushrooms had an effect of three years of therapy. And I've done mushrooms quite a few times. I've done ayahuasca. And my mantra is, oh, it's just like therapy without having to go through all the therapy. Instead, you have like the galactic beings there in front of you giving you this guidance, you know, instead of like a human therapist. But it's coming out now. So an acid, last year, they just released a study. Um, we've known ever since the creation of acid how it can help us. The government used acid in order to tap into mental abilities with MK Ultra soldiers in order to um, make it that they could remote view and do all types of crazy stuff to promote and help the military industrial complex. And this is all mainstream. On CIA.gov, CIA's website, they talk about the acid experiments and what they used it for and the remote viewing on CIA's website. So last year, there was a crowdfunding campaign done to research it. No one wants to put any effort into researching acid on the scientific level because if we were to understand the brain and we can release all these traumas, what benefit is there for you know big pharma? So there, there was this crowdfunding campaign done and these um, alternative scientists came up with a ton of money and they spent, I don't know how long, researching acid. They released a video six months ago uh, five to ten minute video completely mind-blowing showing you this is your brain on acid this is what it does this is what you're understanding these brain these parts of your brain are activated this is what we can do in order to heal you from it so heal you from traumas and all types of sicknesses so that was coming out and then just three weeks ago another study got released on MDMA showing that MDMA can actually help you uh, cure depression and a lot of other ailments and Dr. Bronner's which is an organic conscious um, soap, um, liquid soap, I guess, and, and bar soap company that is extremely uh, in alignment with this message, actually donated $5 million, this is three weeks ago, $5 million to assisting in the integration of MDMA usage in the US. 
They, so you don't just get $5 million just to throw it away. They, it's really happening. We really find this out and the cover up with all of this information can't be covered up anymore because too many people are being healed from it. So that's, it's very important right now just to touch on this, just to talk to you about this and then relate it to sound frequency. So here we go. Here is the brain and you can see the pituitary gland right here, pituitary gland. So this is where, this is where the, um, the, um, the DMT is actually released. This slide I actually use in my presentation on ancient civilizations because we have Egyptian hieroglyphs here. So the Egyptian eye of Horus is actually a representation of the third eye. And you can look at it to the right over here. This is the Egyptian eye of Horus. Look at it. Look how similar it is to the third eye. The Egyptians actually created that, um, created that purposefully because not only is it the eye of Horus representing the third eye, but it's the exact same flow and structure that the pineal gland and the pituitary gland actually have and are encompassed within inside our brain. And you can go down right here and then you can see in the um, bottom corner, we have the actual hieroglyph. And then it goes even further. The eye of Horus is, and the pineal gland, which is the same structure, are made completely of musical intervals. That is all vibration or frequency. We're made of it just like Da Vinci showed the, the model of the man with his arms out with the uh, fractals and the Fibonacci spiral going around us that we're all in harmonic resonance with the mathematical uh, equations of the universe. Okay, so how does this connect to sound healing? Well, sound healing aligns the chakras, centers, and creates deep states of meditation in which DMT is released in the brain. So when you're meditating and in sound frequency, it's actually inducing a mild-like DMT experience. And dormant areas of our brain, our DNA, and our consciousness can be activated through sound healing and the release of this, uh, this substance. Incredible similarities between enlightenment awake, and awakening experiences and the experiences induced when taking plant medicines. So four, three to four years ago, I went to something called Vipassana, which was a 10-day silent meditation retreat in the woods. And... I had actually just done ayahuasca for the first time around three weeks before that. I did a, the, I, when I did the ayahuasca, it wasn't too much of a journey. I didn't really get full experience, even though I got a lot out of it that other people say that they had. But when I went to the 10 day meditation retreat, after the fifth day, I was on a psychedelic journey. I was getting visuals nonstop. After the third day of being at the meditation retreat, every time I would close my eyes, I would see an HD movie quality um, of my life, of all my suppressed memories, everything I forgot, going back, 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 age 16, age 12, age 10, I couldn't stop it. So imagine for three to 10 days, seven full days of nine hours of meditation a day, starting at 4 a.m., and I'm just on this journey of psychedelic awareness, all the things that they say you get from ayahuasca. And what is happening is that when you're in stillness and in quiet and darkness, uh, well, it wasn't dark, but when you're your eyes are closed, it's dark. But when you're in, in stillness and you don't have to talk, what happens is your unconscious mind merges with your conscious mind. Your subconscious and conscious merge. In this day and age, especially now, we're so preoccupied with got to pay the bills, got to get to work, got to make my lunch, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, got to do this, got to do that. We're so preoccupied with that that our whole entire conscious mind doesn't have any time to remember or process a subconscious mind. So instead, all of these traumas, all of these realities gets locked in our subconscious mind. We start acting out from it. We start um, acting inappropriately or disharmonic or chaotic. And it's because we don't have time or the energy to process it. So what happens when you disconnect from all of that? Well, after the third day, your conscious and your, sub your subconscious and your conscious mind become one and the same. And all the thoughts that you suppress and all the issues you suppress will just flood into your reality for you to be dealt with. And it was, in essence, an ayahuasca journey. And I've done other journeys after that. And nothing, nothing has been more powerful than 10 days of solid meditation. And I highly recommend, if anybody's interested, type in Vipassana on the internet. It's a free retreat all over the world, 10 days completely mind-blowing amazing okay so incredible similarities said that and so the similarities include sacred geometry vibrations and vis uh, visions so when i when i do a psychedelic plant 
medicine. I will see sacred geometry. I'll see like flower of life, fractal, seed of life, Metatron's cube. I'll see frequencies. Everything's breathing. Everything's vibrating. I'll see visions. I'll see colors. When we do sound healing on people, they see the exact same thing. It is the same. It's just a different way to get to the same reality. There are many pathways to the same destination, which is a famous quote from the Vedas. And DMT, plant medicines, sound healing, meditation, those are all just different permission slips to get to the enlightened state that we're all, we're all striving for, I would say. All right, so let's take a deep breath real quick, guys. So that, that ends the physiology of the brain component. Now we're going to go into talking about specific frequencies and we're going to talk about the 432 hertz and then go into talking about sophagia tones. So what is the cosmic 432? And that's the cosmic 432 has picked up a lot of uh, momentum in the recent years. And when I was into spirituality like this 16 years ago, it wasn't really like one of the hot topics, but now for the last few years, it's just been going around everywhere. Everyone's talking about 432. What, well, so what is 432? Well, one thing that we've found that it happens to be the frequency of the universe, that the black hole in the center of our galaxy is just like any other celestial body. It emanates its own vibratory electromagnetic frequency. And the frequency emanating from the center of our galaxy, the center of our galaxy in the Milky Way is 432 hertz, boom, 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 all the way out, completely flooding the cosmos and the space. The dark energy and the space between space is 432 hertz. Also, the global music scale was set to 432 hertz and moved to 440 hertz in 1953. So originally, the music scale, the global music scale, meaning that um, what we base our musical tuning off, Right now, for example, if you get a guitar tuner and you're going to tune your guitar, it's based on A equals 440. So before 1953, A equals 432. But why did it change to 440? So what happened was that towards the end of World War II, um, Hitler and his PR man, I uh, forget his name right now, and a few other individuals actually got together and this the PR representative was saying, hey, I have a recommendation, guys, from my understanding of the science that we've been experimenting. I feel that we should change the music scale to all the countries that were conquered to 440 hertz from 432. So it wasn't accepted, though. Um, it wasn't accepted widely by all the representatives there. They didn't understand the science behind it. They completely just sh um, sh shook it off and said, no, nah, it's okay, let's not do it. So then what happened was the Nazis lost the war. Nazis lost the war, Project Paperclip occurred, and Project Paperclip is the also mainstream knowledge on CIA's website, so this is all real. Project Paperclip occurred, and Nazi officials were taken from Germany, uh, scientists and high-level military officials, and they were taken all over the world. Um, a lot of them were taken to Argentina, and there's actually a town there where all these people are German people there, but they are literally the offspring of the... Um, the exiled, they weren't even exiled, the Nazi officials that were escaping persecution. But Project Paperclip happened. The Nazis infiltrated world governments on an unprecedented level. They took over all over the place. They even went into our U.S. government, and they're actually represented now in the U.S. government. There's a fascist rule coming from Nazi agenda right now happening in our government. So they went everywhere, and the U.S. was behind it all. They wanted them. Even the, the head of NASA, when NASA was created, was the head of the Nazi space program. NASA is the Nazi space program continued in the U.S. And he even said when, just a little side note, when they asked him how he um, created the rocket to get us to the moon, he said, well, I can't say too much, but I want to let you know that we had help from up there. And that goes into this whole extraterrestrial component of the Nazis and all that. So 432 hertz was moved to was not moved to 440 yet because everybody said no so the project paperclip happened everybody went all over the world and then in 1953 all these key officials that had infiltrated governments and nazi officials and other people that became part of the cabal and governments all got together had this meeting once again and this time they said well here's the evidence behind it all shall we change the music skill from for um 32 to 440 and they said, well, why don't, it would be really good if we had like, you know, the mainstream musicians and um, um, 
and orchestras and all the instrumentalists all over the world in agreement with this. So why don't we pick a, a, quite a few key figures that are like composers and why don't we send out the survey and ask them if they would be interested and they'd be okay with us changing it to 440. Um, and so they did this and bar none, they, they, it came back no, 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 no. But they went ahead and did it everywhere. Anyway. The history books were changed. The um, musical theory skills were changed. The classroom books were changed. Everything was changed. History was literally written by the victors in that moment. We don't. We don't even know that 432 hertz was the music scale, and you can't find any information on that on the internet except for a few places because they rewrote history. 440 happened. So if you look at when that occurred up until now, all of a sudden craziness happened on this planet. Ripple effect of craziness occurred. And what really this represents is 440 is a very disharmonic frequency. 432 hertz is a very harmonic frequency. When you scale everything to 440 hertz and you base all tuning off 440 equals A, you're no longer with the natural A frequency of the universe, which is 432 hertz. You're at a completely disharmonic frequency. Therefore, you create disharmony in whoever creates it and listens to it. So ever since 1953, our music scale has been perpetuating disharmony on this planet. And now for the last five to 10 years, we've completely understood that. Well, not all of us, but a lot of people have understood that. And we can explain it scientifically how 432 hertz is more harmonic, making people move back towards it. If you type in 432 hertz music on YouTube, there's like hundreds of thousands of videos of musicians and songs that have been redone in 432 hertz because there's this whole awareness now that 432 is really the natural harmonic. Like, I listen to Bob Marley all the time at 432 hertz, you know, like, um, and then there's other people like Katy Perry changed some of her songs to 432 hertz. Okay, so 432 is the harmonic tone unit and 440 is chaotic. So if you listen to 432 hertz on a synthesizer and just like a, a synthesizer and you tune it to 432, 432, it'll sound like this. Uh, very like angelic, almost like the angels have come down or you just saw Jesus. And then if you turn into 440, this is how it sounds. E very flat. It's like it only targets one area of your body. It's not a full range. It's said in spiritual traditions that the Eastern language is designed to resonate at 432 hertz. And the English language, which is the Western language, vibrates at 440, which is a very flat tone. So I'm talking right now. And... Even though I have fluctuation in my voice, it's, it's, very, it's very flat for the most part compared to other religions. So now you go back to ancient India, and let's talk about Sanskrit. So there's the, the oldest mantra ever known to man um, that goes like this, and you can kind of see the fluctuation and how they embody full range frequencies. When you embody full range frequencies, you actually activate and hit all the chakras. When you embody one flat tone, you don't do that at all. You over-energize different areas and don't create a balance. So here's um, the first mantra. Om Bhur Bhava Swaha Tatar Vitar Vare Niyam Bargo Deva Syadi Mahi Diyo Yonat Prajote Ata. So you can tell right there that that's completely all over the place. And what's happening is I'm speaking at 432. I'm, I'm activating all my energy centers through the 432 hertz scale. Okay, so now we're going to show you this video. So Brian Forrester, and if you saw the first presentation on sound and uh, vibration in ancient civilizations, we had this in there too. And this is cool because it connects to the science as well as the ancient history. So you get to kind of experience that right now as well. And Brian Forrester has been on many of our webinars. He was just on Full Disclosure Summit that we had um, two weeks ago now. And he is an archaeologist that has gone all over the world and discovered many amazing things, included elongated skulls that look like they're from extraterrestrial origin, and also the harmonics of the sound chambers and of the pyramids. He's on many documentaries, Gaia TV, Ancient Aliens, and Pyramid Code. So in this next one, he's actually discovered the sound frequencies within the pyramids. So let's tune in. This is the entrance to the Red Pyramid. We're going down the shaft and we're going to go into these incredible rooms which are acoustic chambers. 
Forget about the idea of tombs, think sound, and vibrational technology. So this is actually inside, about 20 feet, more than 100 feet to go. Okay, now we're maybe a third of the way in. And Yusuf Awiyan, the dark figure, is about to come past me. Okay, maybe halfway down now, and the heat is already starting to to pick up in here, as well as the heat generated by uh, anticipation and awe. Okay, so we're at the bottom of the descending passageway. It's got to be 90 degrees Fahrenheit in here right now. And now we're going sideways. is tuned to A. That seems to be the sound that it likes the best. So I just walked through uh, a short tunnel into the second of the chambers here. And the sides of them taper in with these almost baffle-like stones. And of course that is, it could be actually an acoustic cone filter of some kind. The lighting's pretty terrible, but we, you can see there is a massive crack in the solid stone. And that's part of the theory, again, that this was an energy generating device, as were some of the others of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, and that they actually became overloaded at one point, partially exploded, and then shut down. And as hard as it may be imagined to believe, we could be talking about that explosion occurring about 12,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. And then we so not to go too much into the ancient history, but I'll give you a little synopsis of what he discovered. But in the Pyramid Code, they show this very, very well. And this is all proven. What I'm about to say right now is it's common mainstream, but not known by the mainstream yet. The pyramids in Egypt were, well, the, the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx were in existence around 9,600 BC, that we know. And at that point, the Nile River through hieroglyphics we've seen was actually, here's the, here's the pyramids, here's the Nile River, was on the other side 9,600 years ago. Through geological studying, we can see how far back we go and where, that, um, where the Nile River was supposed to be. But over time, it went it's on the other side. What would happen is every season the Nile River would flood and it would flood and it would overflow and it would go into these aqueducts underneath the Great Pyramids. Aqueducts underneath it would overflow, go underneath it. In these aqueducts, we have found two copper rods going into the aqueducts, going up from the aqueducts into the pyramid. So what would happen is the water would go into the aqueducts create an electrical current, the electrical current will get picked up by the copper rods, the copper rods will go into the pyramid and into a hollowed out tube, creating the first ever acoustic speaker system. The frequency created by those copper rods would end into those hollowed out tubes and then the frequency which is electric will become sound. Go into the tubes, come out into the king's chamber which is actually the sound chamber where there's a table on there with um, with hieroglyphs all around it of people using tuning forks to do sound healing. So what we're finding is that the pyramids were never used as tombs. And if, if they were used as tombs, they were used as tombs by later civilizations that came thousands of years after the true inhabitants of the pyramids. But the pyramids are actually energy creating devices that utilize sound and frequency in order to heal people. And what, what, I, uh, what I believe and what a lot of people probably that are on our platform believe, it was also sound frequency to create um, enlightened states of consciousness, higher states of consciousness, so they can connect to the divine. And there's even higher who suggests that they spoke to extraterrestrial beings and they utilize sound or frequency for that. So he discovered that there. And then he showed you right at the end 
that crack in the pyramid and it shows that there was an explosion in the pyramid. There was an explosion in the pyramid. There's even burn marks. And uh, it looks like that's from 12,000 years ago, which was when Atlantis fell and Egypt was, got, was created. So it was like the fall of the pre-dynastic Egypt. So it looks like that whatever this generating device was overpowered for some reason and actually created um, cracks and explosion that we can now actually quantify and see. So now let's go into the sulfasal tones. So what are the sulfasal frequencies? Well, the history is the sulfasal tones were actually can be traced back to the medieval hymn to John the Baptist. It was a hymn that was created for John the Baptist. The first six lines of the hymn starts with the successive notes of the sulfasal scale. <clears throat> the first syllable of each line was sung to a note one degree higher than the first syllable of the line that preceded it because the music held mathematical resonance. So for, we'll show you that on the next slide, what I mean by that. So also the sophagial frequencies were designed and given to us, if you will, to inspire mankind to be more God and Christ-like. So that was why it was originally given uh, as a hymn to John the Baptist. It was a hymn to inspire us to be Christ-like. And here we go. Here's the sulfasal scale. So some people, when I say sulfasal tones, they're like, what? What do you mean sulfasal tones? But as soon as I show them this, everyone knows what it is. So sulfasal scale. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. What is that? That's used in music theory worldwide, in different languages even. This scale is what we use to harmonize and to uh, come up with the tones. And people can even use that in order to synchronize different instruments too. So this is the sulfasal scale. And this sulfasal scale came from this hymn to John the Baptist that was in Latin. And here is the hymn. So I'm not going to read it because I don't know Latin, but I will go ahead and show you the, the higher octave resonances here. So ut was actually the original thing before do. Do is an English addition to it, and ut was taken out. But it was originally ut. So it would go ut, re, mi, fa, so, la. It would go up and up and up. And what's happening is you're actually activating the different energy centers from every single line. You'd be saying the first one, the second one, and your frequency raises higher and higher and higher until you get to the end of it, and then you reach the divine. And this is what this stanza actually means. <clears throat> In order that the slaves might resonate the miracles of your creation with loosened vocal cords, wash the guilt from our polluted lip, St. John. So remove the guilt from this because this has the, the, the hint of original sin in it, but it doesn't mean that at all. What it means by slaves might resonate is the followers of the source of God, of consciousness, the offspring of the one. In order that the offspring of the one might resonate the miracles of your creations, everything around us, with loosened vocal cords. So it's saying that we can resonate the frequency of the beauty around us with our vocal cords. So wash Everything, all the pain, the anguish, the lust, the greed, all the lower frequencies from our polluted lips, St. John. And that's why it was created. So what this actually suggests is that the sophagial notes opens up a channel of communication with the divine. And so it's kind of cool that we're using it throughout the world. So technically, people that are using this are actually activating those levels of consciousness unconsciously. How did the sophagial tone come about well the sophagial tones i just told you how they came about but how did the frequencies come about each of these tones have a corresponding frequency that we've now actually been able to show there is a code in the book of numbers so if you go to the book of numbers right in the bible and you go to each of the stanzas or verses that has talks about a day of creation so i'll throw out arbitrary numbers just so you guys can understand say we have 10 stanzas but seven of them are only talking about each day of creation. So there's a Pythagorean reduction method that Pythagoras came up with. You utilize the Pythagorean reduction method. You take the numbers that are in the day of creation stanza, because it's all these different numbers. You put it into the Pythagorean reduction method, and then voila, the end result is the frequency that is for that specific tone, for that specific day of creation. For example, when we take one of these days of creation and we use the Pythagorean reduction method, we arrive at the first sulfasal frequency of the first day of creation, which is 396 hertz. These frequencies were used in over 150 Gregorian chants in the 9th and 10th century. So the 9th and 10th century, 
like almost a thousand years after Jesus, these frequencies were utilized all over the place to activate and liberate traumas and achieve higher levels of consciousness. And here we go. Here's the Sophagia skill. So now we're getting into the science of it all, of how we create. Do you see how the ancient civilizations and the Bible a story of the ancient past is actually connected in order to allowing us to find out what the quantum physical component is to that awareness? So now here we go. Sophagia skill. The first one, 396 hertz, liberating guilt and fear. 417 hertz, undoing situations and facilitating change. 528 hertz which is one of the most common ones. Love and miracles also as DNA repair. Each of these, it's important to know every frequency that is designed for healing, whether it's 432 hertz, whether it's um, a frequency this is for sciatic pain, right? Every one of these has a spiritual component or a physical component, both of them. So for example, 528 hertz, what's the spiritual component? Well, it's unconditional love frequency and miracles. What's the physical component? It repairs your DNA. So every single one of them does something metaphysical and does something on the quantum physics level, which is the DNA repair. Love and Miracles is metaphysics, but it's really the exact same thing because they go hand in hand and complement each other. 639 hertz, connecting and relationships. 741 hertz, expressions and solutions. 852 hertz, returning to the spiritual order. So do you see here how it's almost like a process and a journey of the first stage of releasing on guilt and fear because that's what we acquire during this life. I know I've been having issues releasing my guilt and fear. And just in order to get through that, and a book called The Power Versus Force really has a graph that explains this very well. And it shows you a scale of the frequencies that you need to transcend in order to get to the next one. The first one is guilt. So it's like the first thing to blast through so that you can be open to these other experiences, ultimately leading you all the way to connecting back to the divine. Now, why is this important? Why are sophagia frequencies important? You can utilize each of these frequencies to target certain issues in your body. Many sound healing instruments utilize these frequencies. So if you're ever going to get into sound, and the, re the reason why I originally created these presentations was to teach people full circle, 100% awareness of sound and vibrational healing so that people can become sound healing practitioners, but from an understanding of our ancient past, the science behind it, like really everything you need to know. So um, part of that was we would tell people that most of the instruments that they come across, well, not most of them, quite a lot of instruments out there, tuning forks, even bowls and um, healing tubes and uh, what else, uh, binaural beats on YouTube, they all have sulfagial tones within them. It's really, really common. If you type sulfagial frequency on YouTube, I don't even know how. There was tens of thousands, if not more than that, back when I first started looking into them 10 years ago. But now, like, who knows how much they have. It's just like becoming even more professional in the delivery mechanism for these frequencies. So you're going to find them all over the place. And it redefines history. The sulfagial tones is extremely important to note. First of all, the fact that it was a hymn given to John the Baptist that is actually based on some spiritual component that we now use in mainstream and that we can prove through science. But also, the Christian people, they did not use the frequencies when they first got them. When they were first handed over to the Christians, a lot of different notes and tones and musical scales and harmonies were part of the faith when it started. But they weren't used. The reason for that is that the Christian people had an inherent disgust for the Roman people because of the oppression, because of the lust, the greed that they had, the lavish lifestyles that they would live, and the music that they played all went hand in hand. So when Christianity really came into form, from, um, formation and became, started becoming what it now is, if they really weren't using music and him to connect to the divine because they were trying to be as different from the Romans as possible. So it redefines our history when we realize that Christianity lost. Well, technically we didn't lose anything because everything is perfect the way it is, but Christianity technically untechnical. What do you want to say? Lost maybe a few hundred years of spiritual awareness and really bringing home the truth to what their religion was all about. Not about an external reality, but the God within and the Christ consciousness within us and the resurrection within us and the truth of reincarnation. All of this stuff was connected to the sound and harmonics of the religion. So for years and years, they devolved into this externalized thing that was completely off what Jesus wanted in the first place. 
due to their belief systems at the time. <clears throat> okay. So I think we will take, just cause we're going to jump now into sacred geometry and this is going to be, yeah, we're going to go to sacred geometry and then true world history. So what I'm going to do is I think we've presented quite a lot of information and let me know in the chat room if, how, how you guys feel uh, about everything. And what I'm going to do is just maybe put on like a one to two minute present um, sound frequency right now so that we can integrate all the awareness that we've just acquired and then we can go straight into sacred geometry after that. So why don't you guys just stay tuned, get some tea or a little snack or something, and then let's say we'll be back in four minutes from now.
So sacred geometry, what I've come to the realization of that in sound and frequency is that the frequency is just one component of that awareness, that every single sense that we have has a representation of a specific frequency. So if frequency is the audio component, the visual component is sacred geometry. In fact, every single frequency has its own geometrical shape. And we're going to show you a video in just a bit here of, of a video of actually seeing um, geometry manifest from certain frequencies. So it's extremely important to, to speak about this awareness. What is sacred geometry? Well, you can see right here, here's some um, sacred geometrical shapes. And this artwork has been used in ancient traditions worldwide for ever since the beginning of creation, ever since humans started making artwork. We can find it everywhere. And what they were really doing was they were creating visual representations of specific frequencies. So here's some more. And here are the basic platonic solids. And you kind of can see I'm actually wearing a shirt that has those on it, sacred geometry. Same ones. And then below that, we have the premise of the seed of life, which actually leads to the flower of life. So the second row right here, we start with the Vesco Pisces, and then we can continue to go forward until we get the fifth one to the right, which is the seed of life. And then that, multiple forms of that put together, creates the flower of life. Now, let's go into what exactly sacred geometry is. Well, geometrical shapes, the geometrical shapes that have formed from equations that are the same equations of how our universe is created and how black holes are formed. So the geometrical equations that we actually utilize in order to figure out certain sacred geometrical shapes, we're finding out throughout the cosmos. The black hole in the center of our galaxy, the equation of the singularity is similar to equations for sacred geometry. The Fibonacci spiral of, our, of the galactic arms is the same. The distance between the sun and the moon, the earth and the moon and the sun and our earth, and all of these distances are same distance and intervals based on sacred geometrical equations. So the universe in essence is created from this design. There are also sacred geometrical shapes that take on the design element of harmonic frequencies, like I said earlier, that these sacred geometrical shapes are actually the mirror reflection, the physical, uh, visible reflection of these frequencies. They also represent each dimension of existence. So from my understanding now is that we exist currently in the third dimension. Some people say we're in the fourth dimension, the fourth dimension being time. So within this dimension, we exist within a limited frequency range. We actually currently exist in zero dimensions, one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, four dimensions. So we have basically four full dimensions that we currently coexist in. However, just like light has a certain frequency range, so does um, dimensions. The dimension also has a certain frequency range. And the best way to really explain what a dimension is, is here's some more arbitrary numbers just to kind of give you an idea. From If you have from zero to 100 hertz, for example, hertz being times per second, so 100 times per second, it vibrates. Zero to 100, you now have the first dimension. You have 100 to 200, you have the second dimension. 300 to 400, you have the fourth dimension. Of course, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm just showing you the arbitrary numbers. So let's just say that we exist from zero hertz to 400 hertz. So what that means is we can only see and perceive everything within that frequency range. However, there's a whole entire world of frequencies above us that we can't even perceive in this physical body. And now what I'm noticing is when we come up with the actual frequencies for different dimensions, and then we put them on sand plates or something in order to create the visual component to that frequency, we're finding out that each of these dimensional frequencies have their own sacred geometry. So there is sacred geometry frequencies and there's sacred geometry artwork that represents this dimension and other dimensions. The flower of life is actually the sacred geometrical artwork that represents the physical dimension that we're currently on. And then you go into higher dimensions and you have different um, sacred geometrical shapes that represents that. For example, in the fifth dimension, the, the sacred geometrical shape of the fifth dimension is the Isaka dodecahedron, which is the isocahedron and the dodecahedron combined together. What has been foretold is that when we ascend into this fifth dimension, the electromagnetic grid on our planet no longer becomes a flower of life shape where the meridians are going through that and the ley lines are going through that, but we become an isocadodecahedron in which we have more energetic centers on the planet, greater flow of energy, 
and that encompasses basically the electromagnetic field of the planet. Also, something that we're mostly familiar with, ancient artwork, sacred geometry is ancient artwork used to expand and awaken the collective consciousness. So we actually have, my wife and I are actually moving out of our place, so we're pretty much pulling everything off the walls, but up until a week ago, we had everything, everywhere sacred geometry all over the place, activating me in, in every which way and form. And if you see my past webinars, I used to have the sacred geometry right behind me, because what is it? It's the, there's no difference to playing 432 hertz on your audio and looking at the frequency of the geometry, looking at the geometry of 432 hertz has the exact same thing. One's activating you through your audio senses, the other one's activating through your visual senses. So if you put sacred geometry on and around you, not only have we given it that belief system where it affects us like that, but the quantum physical component to it is the fact that that visual element helps activate our consciousness, which is why a lot of ancient uh, civilizations used it because they were using it to activate their consciousness and that's why they actually used it as representations for their spiritual and religions so we're going to show you a few um, sacred geometry shapes here and here we go into the uh, vesica pisces and this is actually the premise for the christian religion the vesica pisces and we start with the circle and the first division is into this right here the vesica pisces now here we have the Vesco Pisces, and inside of it we have the star tetrahedron. And a lot of us are probably familiar with the star tetrahedron because obviously um, the Hebrew faith, they actually use that as their cornerstone for their religion and their symbol for their religion, which they actually got from the sacred geometry component, which was actually derived from sound and frequency. So when they're utilizing that symbol in the scriptures, they're actually representing the frequency that that represents. And the star tetrahedron is, is a very, very powerful um, sacred geometrical shape throughout the universe. And here we go again. Here's another ancient artwork with the star tetrahedron. And then in the middle, you see the spiral, kind of like the spiral of the galaxy. And in the center, you have the black hole. Like, and all the star tetrahedron encompasses it. They even say that our Merkaba, the Merkaba, which is the aura of the human body, is actually in the form of a star tetrahedron. And some people go as far to say that in when we ascend to a higher octave of existence, maybe not this first octave we're going to now, but eventually, you don't need spacecraft. You don't need light ships. You don't need any of that. Um, Quantum physics proves non-locality, that things can exist in multiple places at the same exact time. So what we can do with our Merkaba is we can activate it, spin it, and we can actually transport ourselves to different areas of the cosmos utilizing the sacred geometrical shape. And we see here, this one is probably one of my most favorite, and this one in the next slide, two of my most favorite, because it really shows that this ancient artwork of sacred geometry is a representation of the macro and the microcosm. So here we have the representation of the microcosm. You can see the, the circle here with the one dimension and the dot in the middle representing the seeding of the egg. And then we have the Vesca Pisces represents the splitting of the cells, so on and so forth, to the fruit of life, which is the seed of life. And then we have the flower of life. So the ancient people that created this artwork were not only representing frequencies that can actually affect us and um, raise our consciousness into higher levels of existence. But they were also, um, they also somehow knew the cellular division of the mitosis of creation and how we came into existence. Even if they didn't know that because they didn't have advanced technology to know the biology of the human, which may, they may or may not, but they had this wisdom and awareness of how creation was on the macro and the micro level. And this artwork is a representation of that. And I love this meme because this puts it all into perspective. As above, so below. So we have here the universe, and you can see the mitosis right next to it, next to the sacred geometry. And it's the same thing happening throughout. It's all the cellular division using the sacred geometrical equations in order to create everything in the physical universe and everything in the quantum universe. I would say that, you know how I said earlier that quantum physics and Newtonian physics don't see hand in hand. I would see that, say that the only thing that really we can utilize in order to compare and draw similarities to quantum physics and Newtonian physics is sacred geometry because sacred geometry can be used to explain the quantum world and the physical world. And here we go, here's the physical world. So the Fibonacci spiral, which is the premise of sacred geometry, the golden ratio, and you can see it throughout nature. Right here we have 
the sacred geometry of a hurricane. It has the perfect Fibonacci spiral. It's going based on these equations that have been given to us, given throughout the universe. And then we have the spiral hands of the galaxy, the exact same Fibonacci spiral, the conch of the shell, the um, sunflower right here, all based on sacred geometry. Even a baby before it's born, the nebula being created, this crop circle here, the way the plant forms, even your nostril, the curve of your nostril, Fibonacci, the curvature of your ear, Fibonacci, the way the water flushes down the toilet or the sink, Fibonacci spiral. Everything is doing the spiral. And it's kind of interesting because what is it doing? What is the spiral doing? It's going to the singularity, to the oneness. It's an infinite process that never ends trying to get to the one, which is the center of the Fibonacci. And the best representation of that is our galaxy, the spiral hands of the galaxy wrapping around, going round and round and round until we get to the center of, of our galaxy, which is this supermassive black hole. So sacred geometry is, is key. And the next slide is the... The last slide on in regards to um, quantum physics, sound, vibration, and sacred geometry. So I just want to end this component by saying that sacred geometry and music and frequency are two huge components that are now resurfacing in the world. That this has been used for a long, long time, but it's kind of been considered woo-woo, esoteric, new age stuff for a very, very long time. But time for that is over. Now it's really the time to realize this stuff as a science. When we realize this stuff as a science, we're gonna cure world disease. We're gonna cure sickness. We're gonna live in space. We're gonna create underground cities. We're gonna do whatever we want in a conscious way that creates harmony on the planet without destroying it because we can have a better understanding of ourselves a place in the universe and the technology that we need to use in order to have a better experience of life. So it's extremely important to really tell people about this and bring this awareness out. This is just a grass level. So I want to end this component by talking about this quote and it is a big quote, but I am going to read it to you and break it down because this right here from this individual, Candice Perk, PhD, she actually breaks down the science of vibration, music of the spheres and how sound carries messages messages is messages sorry that can really assist us in aligning ourselves and healing so here we go i'm going to read it slowly and then we're going to go back through and break it down every cell pulsates reflex and interacts with acoustic oscillations of the medium even the earth and the sun vibrate in unison based on a main rhythm of 160 minutes each musical note is therefore united to non-audible notes of higher octaves and each symphony to other symphonies that we do not hear. And although they make our cells oscillate and possibly resonate, even DNA has its own melody. The musical nature of nuclear matter from atoms to galaxies is now recognized by official science. Basically, receptors function as scanners. They cluster in cellular membranes waiting for the right ligand to come, dancing along through fluids surrounding each cell and mount them, binding with them and tickling them to turn on and get to motivated to vibrate a message into the cell. Binding of the ligand to the receptor is likened to two voices, striking the same note and producing a vibration that rings a doorbell to open the doorway to the cell. So this really, this quote right here covers everything that we just spoke about. So let's break it down just a bit. The earth and the sun vibrate in unison based on the main rhythm of 160 minutes. The entire universe has this rhythm and this scale based on different geometrical equations that are in harmony with each other and going by this, this rhythm that we can actually see and experience. Even DNA has its own melody. We've proven that. The musical na nature of nuclear matter from atoms to galaxy is recognized by official science. So we now know that atoms and galaxy is have musical components to it, and science is now saying that too. But here we go. Here's the, in, the part that really drives everything home for me, is that why this presentation was created was to teach people about sound healing and the science behind it all. So how does sound healing work? Because we can all understand that, yes, this sound, oh, I'm picking up the sound, it's aligning certain areas of my body. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. But there's actually a deeper science to it, and she's explaining it here. What happens is the frequency goes in to the ligand, which is the surrounding area in the cellular membrane, which is the, the liquid surrounding the cell, and it carries the frequency that you're absor absorbing. So say I'm playing a Tibetan bowl and the frequency is going to your body. It attaches to the membrane and the ligand, and it goes into the cell. Then it vibrates the cell. It continues to vibrate the cell until it matches the vibration that the cell needs in order for the cell to open itself up and allow the frequency to release the message that it has for it. 
So every sound, every frequency has a message, whether it's, hey, heal your heart or like uh, release that trauma or like um, be, have more energy or let's put you to sleep because you you like had insomnia, whatever it is. It's like it's sending the message into your cell. And the, when the cell and the frequency match, it unlocks it and releases it in. And that, in essence, is what is happening with sound healing. So I hope you guys enjoyed that presentation. And that was everything in regards to sound healing, um, quantum physics, sacred geometry. But now we're just going to end with talking about the true world history. Because the real reason why I created this event um, and I create everything based on sound and frequency that I've done in the past, I'm going to be doing some future events, is really because it has an effect on our awareness of our ancient history and the wisdom that they knew. We spoke a little earlier about ancient Egypt and how they had this awareness of sound, frequency, and technology. But even in ancient Atlantis and other great civilizations like Lemuria, we're now being able to prove that they use levitation devices, they use advanced quantum technology, these organic technology, not using nuts and bolts and uh, so externalized technology, but fusing their consciousness with this technology in order to create a really beautiful paradise planet. So by learning this awareness about true world history, we're now able to learn the lessons that they learned and also not repeat the same mistakes because a lot of these past civilizations, like in ancient Atlantis, they made some mistakes that ultimately led to their downfall. And even though it was all meant to be because the dev devolution of consciousness really allowed us to get to where we are now so we can have this experience and go back up to enlightenment, but they actually went in a disharmonic route that actually took them down from falling from grace, they fell from grace into a reality where they became so externalized. We used to live in a reality where everybody knew sound and frequency could heal you. All these ancient um, traditions knew that they created these instruments for that. These original instruments were never created to entertain us. Instrumentation on earth was not originally created for entertainment. Entertainment was a consequence. Instruments were originally created for healing and aligning from or, or synchronizing the group or finding a rhythm so that they can all do something together. It was always something in order to uplift and empower the collective. However, after thousands of years of devolution and lower, lowering of frequency, we've ended in a world where the um, the healing component and the entertainment component component were equal, but the healing component completely has dropped and everything is now purely entertainment. And because we exist in a world where everything is purely entertainment, we're unconscious of the fact that these uh, frequencies are affecting us always. So if we were to um, play some music, for example, it's not like you're listening to this music thinking like, oh, what frequencies are there healing us? And a lot of you on here could probably could think of that, but most of the people on the planet they don't think that. They just have this frequency playing. It's doing all types of craziness to them. The frequencies are tuned to different um, notes, unconsciously and consciously, that create this uh, distortion. And what is occurring is that we're getting all these effects from it, and we're living out all these experiences on Earth based on disharmonic tones. So what would happen if we lived on Earth based on the harmonic tones? And that's what I want to see, and that's what our true world history is going to really give us the awareness for. So in regards to true world history, we have the procession of the equinox where we have this 26,000 year cycle. So we have the galaxy and in the center, we have the supermassive black hole. Earth is, as they say, you are here, we're positioned at the end of our galaxy and the end of the spirals going around and around. But as we go around, we're also going in circles. So we're going around and around, but we're not just going around, we're shooting really fast around it. So we're going in a Fibonacci spiral around our galaxy. Within that, there is the milk of the Milky Way, which is the plane of the Milky Way, which is the high concentration of ether, also called the photon belt. And every 26,000 years, Earth goes around it. Every 13,000 years, we dip into it. Every 13,000 years, we dip back into it. 13,000 years, 13,000 years, and so on and so forth. What we've now realized is that this 26,000 years is actually a representation of the cycles of consciousness. So 26,000 years is a representation of us achieving this level of enlightenment and then going to what's called the dark ages and back up again. It's an evolution where we keep going up and down, up and down, having all types of experiences from bliss-like experiences to complete darkness experiences. Now, if you can look at this, um, look at this graph right here and you can see the procession of the equinox and see kind of the timeline and if you look back 
10,000 BC and we go back to the constellation of Leo, that was kind of the time where they say Atlantis existed and the rise of Egypt was, was at a time where humanity was in the positive element of our creation, but we we're dipping below. And what's happened ever since then is we've gone through a devolution. And this is what I'm talking about in regards to the instruments. We've gone through a devolution where everything has become so external to us that we're not realizing that these frequencies can heal. And then we get to 2000 AD or plus or minus how many hundred years. We go to 2000 AD and all of a sudden we're ending the dark ages and we're shifting into the, the higher consciousness where it says Christ's return, which is the Christ consciousness within. And we're going into the age of Aquarius, which is leading us into the age of enlightenment. So we're actually going to the bronze age, and then we're going to go into the golden age. And this is all connected to frequency, the frequency of the planet. When we're at this lower vibration, we're at the lower frequencies, and all we attract are these lower frequencies repetitively, repetitively perpetuating this reality on earth. And then we go into this higher realm, and then all of a sudden we get into an existence where we're increasing the frequency. So right now, I feel, I want to say this, that we see a lot of craziness on the planet, a lot of chaos, especially with political movement, anti-establishment, wars all over the place, craziness. But what has time has shown and what history shows us and what uh, ancient wisdom teaches us and now science and quantum physics is teaching us is that the vibration of the planet is increasing. However, when you increase the vibration of the planet, it's not like you just shift from trauma to bliss. The traumas are locked in our cellular membranes. Just like you have muscle memory, you have cellular memory. Your muscle memory, obviously, is when you're a kid and you work out and then you grow up and you get older and you work out again, you can tap back into that muscle memory. Cellular memory is pretty much the same thing, except that it stores traumas and whatever other significant experiences that are locked up in your body, not only from this life, but from past lives. So what sound healing and quantum healing can do, and this is more about quantum healing because technology is going to come out very soon where we're going to have quantum healing devices that are just like sound chambers where people go into. You don't have to listen to anything, but frequency is still affecting them. So what happens with, um, with quantum physics now is that we're realizing that we are shifting and releasing the traumas locked in our cellular memory that the sound frequency the quantum energy the vibrations when we do a sound healing it's vibrating the message into your cell to release the trauma so what happens when you release the trauma in this world of 3d it gets experienced in this physical reality so we're looking at the trauma of all of our cells releasing this toxic energy manifest throughout the cosmos or well, not throughout the cosmos throughout our earth right now and we're seeing it happen so the the message of hope is that it may look crazy, but it's not as crazy as it looks. It's really just part of the process. Right now, everything is just crumbling and falling away. And all the traumas that we're here to release are being released. We're at the singularity. We're at the still point, the ending of one generation or one age into another age. We're almost like going into the black hole and coming out into another universe. That's basically what's happening right now. But when you go into the black hole, you can't go with your baggage. So we're here on earth having the same experiences day in, day out almost, where the same lessons are just hitting us in the face over and over and over again, asking us to release everything. Whereas thousands of years ago, you know, life was much simpler and there wasn't so much stimuli and you weren't confronted with your demons, so to speak, every single day. And you didn't have to live out your traumas and have to deal with stuff so you can be more present in the world. But now it's like, it's a theme that we were at the ends of the spiral of the galaxy before and it would take forever to have these experiences. But now we're just right here. We're right here in the center, ready to go within. So this is the lifetime where we're going to transcend not just our own personal karma, but the galactic karma so that we can ascend to this new world. And here is the uh, picture of the procession of the equinox, which also ties into the... Um, the axis of the planet and you can see that the axis of the planet has shifted from being completely straight to actually being tilted and when the axis of the planet is straight we have normalization of weather which normalizes emotions and we have uh, normalization of natural disasters but when we have it shifted like that all of a sudden crazy chaos and um and natural disasters occurs on the planet and we exist in that earth right now so science has actually shown that the earth's axis has actually been tilting slowly back to a straight axis and they said that when the Chile, uh, Chilean earthquake happened two years ago, it was one of the main things that they came out with was the fact that, um, that the Earth's axis actually shifted a little bit back to being centered and for 
way more than 25,000 years, that even those, um, even those civilizations show the Earth's axis as completely straight. All right. So that's it, everybody. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed that, um, the presentation. And there's a lot of information, so you can catch it on the replay and check it all back at any time. We'll send that out to you in a couple of days. And just a couple of other presentations that I, I'm going to do and I have done. The last one is the sound of vibration the future. So the next one I'm going to do is actually going to talk about the future applications of sound of vibration. We've talked about how the ancients used it. We've talked about the human physiology of the brain, sacred geometry, and then also the scientific component of it so we, that we can prove it to ourselves. And now we're going to talk about the, the future. What's really important is for us to realize how we're going to use this. We got all this information, right? But how are we going to change it? So I'm actively doing research and connecting with people that are using quantum technology to create different devices, whether it's free energy technology or healing devices. And we're going to start talking about it and discussing what's going on because this is the beginning of a whole new field of awareness, a whole new field of technology. So the future is really what it's all about. And this is my wife and myself, and this is a setup of us doing sound healing um, at, in Glendora. And this is kind of how it looks when we go and do this. We do sound healings at least every other week, sometimes weekly. And we facilitate a really interactive experience where we go around people, we play it around their heads, and put it on the chakras, play the did we do all over them. And it's a really epic experience. You can see some of the tools we have here. We have the sound bowls, the meditation bowls, the sophagia healing tube, which is right in the center right here, which is at 528 hertz. The did we do right there, thunder drum, and we have tuning forks, and we have anytime we travel anywhere, we find something cool, we like to acquire it and bring it to the experience. It's kind of awesome too because it's really like the first time ever that all these sound tools that have been utilized all over the world for by different traditions, different civilizations are now coming together as one because of globalization and because we can just pop on a plane and be somewhere like in a matter of hours, we're able to acquire and actually bring an experience accumulating everything. A lot of these um, instruments were designed specifically for certain things that the civilization was looking for. That for example, the Tibetan bowls, a very higher celestial awareness and tap into different frequencies that are the same frequencies of planetary bodies like the 432 hertz bowl so very celestial sounds and if you think of hinduism and ancient vedic knowledge you think of like very spaced out being celestial beings even their gods look like aliens like extraterrestrials flying on crafts and throwing lightning bolts at each other but then you go to other traditions such as the native americans or you go to the aborigines in australia and all of a sudden you have these earth-like instruments you have the didgeridoo which is the sound of the earth is literally Schumann resonance coming out of that which is the frequency of the planet you have the native american stick the native american stick uh, rain stick is actually a rain sound which is a very grounding sound so it's really cool to know that before the native americans for example were very much perpetuating the connection to earth drums and um drums and uh and the uh, rain stick and then the hindus and um, the Chinese were cultivating the connection to the stars, but now we're able to bridge the gap. It's the first time ever, I would say for like a, probably at the least maybe a hundred years, but definitely only actively for the last 50 years where people are like doing this all over the place and only really to the level that it is now in this year, in this moment, because sound healing is really becoming a huge thing, that we're able to um, bridge the gap and bring these frequencies to the public and bridge heaven and earth. We got the heaven frequencies and we got the earth frequencies. And that's because now is the time to bridge heaven and earth and bring heaven down to earth. 